This is Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. We're glad to have you along. The summer grazing season is going to commence in a week or two as cattle are turned out, although the growth of our native grasses in Kansas has been slowed by the late cool weather that we've had. So as you think about turning those stalkers out, you need to be sure that you have your mineral supplementation program all lined out. And some thoughts on that now from Dale Blassie. Beef Cattle Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and he's by our way to give some basic guidelines on that supplementation and what's required here. Dale, one of the mainstays, ionophores, and uh, those are essential, generally speaking, you think? Uh, generally, uh, inclusion of ionophores, you've got to also factor the price in the increased cost for delivery. But we typically see a tenth to maybe 15 hundredths of a pound response with the inclusion. Uh, there are some other side benefits as well in terms of the coxie issues, which really on grass is not much of a problem. But we do tend to get better utilization from the grass with inclusion of ionophores, uh, more so in my opinion with menensin or rumensin as opposed to Bovatec. Okay, so there may be a subtle difference there between Subtle the difference. I think the, uh, the ability, the intake is not much of an issue with the Bovatec and more so with Menensin. It's a little, it tends to restrict the intake of a mineral supplement about 50%. So you've got to factor in and you've got to counter that with, say, dried molasses, which entails an increase in costs, or something like a distiller's grains to improve the, the smell and flavor for the animals. And incidentally, K-State has looked at both ionophore products extensively through research. Over and, and I guess bottom line, Eric, is, is they both work. There may be subtle nuances between the two, but I, I believe it's very clear that we, we do see a benefit from improved performance. In regard to actual mineral needs to supplement what the grass isn't providing, one of the key minerals would be phosphorus in most instances, Dale? Absolutely. And, and well, early on, uh, we got phosphorus levels, at least the pastures that we sampled last year. Uh, we were looking right around 0.12%. With advancing season, going into June and certainly towards the end of July, we saw a definite decline in phosphorus content in the grass. So early on, it's adequate. We figure most mineral supplements to deliver about 50% of the animal's needs. Mm -hmm. And so with a two to four ounce per head per day inclusion with these calves, we presume the grazing forage to provide at least 50% of the animal's mineral requirements. Mm -hmm. Trace minerals should be part of the package? Yes, and, and there's a lot of issues in terms of, of how and, and what uh, mineral form, be it the oxides or the sulfates, and whether one can utilize an injectable or, or even go with the chelated or complex, the proteinates and everything that goes down the road. I think it's important to understand that deficiencies just don't happen overnight. There are stages of being short for a period of time before it moves into something that is obviously a diagnosis. And given the time frame and the length of our grazing, most calves go into grass. I very much believe that the trace mineral needs of these calves, at least in the short term, is overblown, if you will. So you don't want to... uh Spend frivolously there in terms of your mineral supplementation. If you need to know if copper or zinc are necessary, a forage analysis can help that out. Uh, it, it it just gives you a point in time, and, and based on, again, we ran several analysis last year. There's a lot of variation. And the other thing to bear in mind is our animals out there selectively graze. They are out there picking the most tender most uh, luscious parts of that plant. And that tends to be where the concentration of of these highly mobile trace minerals, be it zinc or copper, reside. So they're they're actually picking up a lot more than what we would find if we uh, did a uniform trim and, and sent that entire sample in for analysis. Dale, there was a time where inclusion of antibiotics as a defense against such things as foot rot or pink eye was a routine part of the mineral supplementation. Well, that's still an option, but only if it's approved by one's veterinarian through the veterinary feed directive. Well, absolutely. Now, the the rules have changed, and, and we are bound 
to follow the dictates of the law, and it's important to consult with your local veterinarian and gain his or her official opinion and move forward accordingly. One needs to assure that there's adequate intake of whatever supplemental mineral is being provided out there. Absolutely. And, and you know, if you figure a mineral at $500 a ton, and if you just use an average intake or recommended label intake of three to four ounces per head per day, it's really not that hard a math to figure out, given the number of animals and how much mineral is delivered and what the disappearance is to kind of get a, a rate of of consumption. And again, your point is excellent in that an animal really doesn't gain any benefits without ingesting said supplement. So uh, making it available and going close to what the label recommendations are, three or four ounces, with a $500 mineral over 90 days translates into about a $5 and some odd cents cost per animal. Overconsumption can happen as well. And if many mineral feeders are running above, say, five or even six ounces when the recommendation is four ounces, uh, one must consider as well the increase in price, really, when perhaps they may be just chasing after salt, Mm -hmm. which can be adequately remedied with inclusion of some salt blocks out there. Yeah, that's the common limiter that we see out there, salt as that limiting agent. This would be a great point to bring up a recent study that you shared at Cattlemen's Day here at K-State just this past March, Dale, on this very topic of mineral supplementation, salt, trace minerals, stalker cattle response to that particular program. What interesting things did you find out through this work? Well, what we did, Eric, was basically uh, we have 18 pastures and we split those pastures three ways. One treatment was salt block by itself. One treatment was salt block plus an injectable trace mineral source that we uh, provided to the – administered to the animals at the onset of the grazing season. And our third and final treatment was a complete mineral developed from previous work uh, with Dr. Frank Brazel and Dr. Gary Cole was involved as well with this project. So we wanted to compare over 90 days uh, the performance of cattle provided salt, salt plus injectable trace mineral – or a complete mineral that contains salt as well within it. What did you discover about performance? Was it no uniform? Signif- no significant difference. Average daily gain across the board was within five to ten hundredths of a pound. And so, again, applying your pencil and, and asking yourself if animals being introduced to the grass, if there's any degree of stress to these cattle. Are they coming through where they're in very, very poor body condition, where there may be a protein and an energy deficiency, which suggests perhaps a trace mineral problem as well to where this is provided. It's a case-by-case basis. And what we saw, and this is from some earlier work uh, from 1985 when Ron Graber was doing his work with Ed Smith, and it stated their work, you know, uh, basically threw it up in the air as it may or may not be a beneficial management practice. Mm. Uh, Bear in mind, I'm not saying that we don't need minerals in our animals' nutrition. That's certainly off the case there, but we need to evaluate and determine if they are in a state of deficiency or not. And if they're not, for three months out of the grazing season, aside from salt or even a very, very, very minimal complete mineral package can do more than anything for the animal. Point is, don't just routinely go about your supplementation, your mineral supplementation, as you've done year upon year upon year. Give it another look because that may be a cost savings. That's right. And, and you know, these cattle went to grass at 700 pounds, and we had them on a previous study for 90 days prior to that. And they, were in, they weren't fleshy, but they were in good condition going to grass. So their liver stores and everything, they were under no undue stress going to grass. And with the higher quality of the forage, the grass is out there with a higher trace mineral and phosphorus and everything there. For at least 30 to 45 days of that grazing season, they were meeting their needs with that product by itself. We're economizing any way we can with the economics of the day in beef cattle production. So while mineral supplementation may be worthwhile, you need to examine what you're doing with great scrutiny, put it that way, as you head into the grazing season very soon. And Dale, we appreciate the word. Thanks for coming over once again. Thank you. 
By the way, that study that he cites is in the Cattlemen's Day Proceedings from the 2018 event. You can find that at asi.ksu.edu. It is an evaluation of salt, trace mineral sources, and growth implants on performance of stalker cattle grazing native Flint Hills pasture in this instance. With us talking over mineral supplementation strategies for stalkers, Dale Blassie, he's a beef cattle specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Now this break, when we come back, we'll hear from the individual who's presenting this week the latest installment of the Dan Upson Lecture Series here at K-State. She'll tell us about a long-standing and worldwide humanitarian effort that is deeply rooted in agriculture. That's coming up next here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Kansas State University is hosting this week what is called the Dan Upson Lecture, and the student group Food for Thought organizes this every year in honor of the longtime veterinarian here at Kansas State University. The presenter of the lecture this year comes from an organization that is quite well known. It's been around for decades, and it still is accomplishing great things as a humanitarian outreach effort around the globe. It's called Heifer International, and presenting the Dan Upson Lecture is the Chief of Mission Effectiveness with Heifer International. It's our pleasure to have Hillary Hattigan, Mike's side. Hillary, welcome to K-State. Thank you. And at the outset, if you would please reacquaint us with Heifer International. Mm-hmm. Many folks in agriculture have uh, been involved, if if not simply known about the program before. But. Mm-hmm. Um, so Heifer has a very simple mission, to end hunger and poverty and care for the earth. So it's simple, but it's huge. And we were founded by uh, a man called Dan West, and he was uh, volunteering in Spain during the, uh, the Spanish Civil War, and he was... Um, handing out powdered milk and reconstituted milk to um, children and families in need. And he looked around and he could see green grass across all the fields. And and from a farming background himself, he said, this is crazy. So he came back to the States and was very focused on sharing his idea with his local farming community and his local churches. And his idea was, instead of sending food aid, why don't we start to look for ways to send productive animals And so the first shipment of livestock was sent to Puerto Rico in 1944, and it was a shipment of heifers, and they were pregnant heifers. And when they landed in uh, Puerto Rico and gave birth, the families that received them passed on the new offspring to more families, and that has become very central in heifer's work. So heifer is about communities reaching out to help other communities, and as people become assisted, they then also become a donor themselves. So a cow can make a huge difference in the life of a family. It starts to produce milk immediately, so families start to have food for their own nutritious benefits very quickly, and they can also sell quickly. And so um, a cow is a really valuable asset to a family in need. They can have both food and a small amount of income. But heifer doesn't only work with cows. Heifer now works with um, many different species of livestock. And we work to provide seed and um, seedlings and plant trees, etc. So that we're really looking at a holistic livestock um, and integrated agriculture development and community development as well as the basis of all of the work we do. We're now working in 27 countries and we work largely with smallholder farmers especially farmers who are on less than $2 a day income and who may be farming land of one to two hectares at the most. And I've been with Heifer now for 18 years. I really enjoy my work and I really enjoy 
living in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is where we're headquartered. The hope is, as this aid is provided, self-sufficiency can be Mm -hmm. promoted. Absolutely. Which is a tall task unto Mm -hmm. itself with Mm -hmm. limited resources. Mm -hmm. But that's being accomplished in many Mm -hmm. quarters of the world, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So we, you know, we're 74 years old. And so we've kind of honed this model. A part of the value of the model we work with is the community development work that we do. And we bring communities together that haven't necessarily worked as a group before and we help them in forming a group and then in working together to build the training and the technical development of both um, having livestock but also of producing food, fodder and ensuring all of the requirements for having the livestock are met. So I'll give you an example from Malawi. In Malawi, we recently completed a study using what we called a social network analysis and so we reached out to the families that had been part of the heifer program and talked to them about who they had passed on either training or knowledge or had worked together on economic grounds with, who who are the families that they were working with. And then we went to those families and looked at who do you reach out to? Who do you reach out to for help? Or how do you, who do you reach out to to actually help people with what they're doing? And we looked at the network and we were able to assess that for every one family heifer was helping, five other families were benefiting from the inputs that they had received. And then we looked at what ways are they benefiting, and it was things like they were also gaining the knowledge and technical expertise by working with the original families that we'd helped. And then we did an economic analysis of those families, and we could see that for every dollar that the family that heifer had worked with every dollar they were raising, the five families that were also benefiting were getting about 78 cents. So all of the all of the families were benefiting in the community, both those that work directly with Heifer and those beyond. So we kind of look, well, what's happening here? And it's because the families who are kind of the second layer out are starting to build their own businesses. So, you know, the families with the cows need food and need fodder. And so other families would start entrepreneurial businesses to bring that in. Or the families that have got the cows start to produce milk. So entrepreneurs are starting to build businesses where they are using a motorcycle to come and collect milk and transport it to the milk chiller for it then to be transported to a processor. So what we've seen is that there's a local economic growth that starts because of the inputs that Heifer has that really triggers a much broader development than that which Heifer is uh, directly responsible for. And so, yeah, it's really possible to end hunger and poverty for those families that are on that pathway. What would Heifer International consider, Hillary, as the uh, hot spots currently that the program needs to address? Is there any particular (coughs) geographic area or specific economic situation Mm -hmm. out there? Mm -hmm. We like to work where there are farmers that are extremely poor, um, living below the poverty line set by the World Bank, which is $2 a day. And where there are large enough numbers that we can really build that kind of economic base that will transform for the long term the lives of farmers that we work with. So a lot of our focus is around Africa, Asia. We're still working in Latin America and Central America especially, where we see economies starting to change and transition and emerge into middle income economies then our work starts to change. Um, It's not necessarily that we'll withdraw, but we're really um, working to build out the kind of market systems in a more commercial way with working with local private sector or local governments. And so we're kind of in in a transition of working with the very poor to eventually transitioning into working into a more market system based economy. And we'll work wherever there is need. What will you be sharing at the Dan Epson Lecture, covering more or less what we've talked about here in regard to the background on the program? Yeah, and I will go into more details. We've, we've, um, over the last few years, we've started to build a very strong evidence base. So we know our program works because we've done research and evaluation around that. And the title of my talk is Mission to Zero. And I told you at the beginning, our, our mission is to end hunger and poverty and care for the earth. And our CEO is adamant. He doesn't mean 
let's help it a little bit. He means let's end it. And so we've begun to measure living income of farmers. So how how do farmers move to a year-on-year sustainable level of income whereby they can have the food nutrition requirements, send their children to school, meet their health care needs and be resilient to shocks. So for us, the living income is the end to hunger and poverty. So that's our mission to zero. Remarkable accomplishments toward those ends. Still much more to go. And so how can one connect with or learn more about Heifer International? Well, um, if you look at our website, www.heifer.org. But I've also had conversations even this morning. There are ways that the university here, I think, could partner with Heifer. How do we learn from what farmers know already here about increasing productivity of livestock? How can we understand the economics across a value chain in ways that help us make decisions with farmers in the countries that we're working in? And the the contexts are incredibly different. And yet when you get to the production of livestock and the economics around it, it's actually very similar no matter what the context And so I think there's a great opportunity um, with the university to build some learning that can help us inform some of the dairy work or the the swine value chains, the poultry value chains that we're working on. Um, So there are multiple ways, I think, that learning more about heifer and engaging with us can help us inform our program. www.heifer.org dot o-r-g that's right that's simple again it's a commendable program and has been for well over 70 years and here's to 70 more or or less if it takes that to reach (laughs) that ultimate goal to zero thank you a pleasure to have you on campus here hillary thank you very much thank you very much she is with heifer international chief of mission effectiveness and she's the presenter of the dan upson lecture here at kansas state university And she has been spending some time talking with folks here at K-State about the mission of Heifer International and the humanitarian outreach across the world. Her name is Hillary Hattigat, and she's been our guest on this part of Agriculture Today. More after this over the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. As I walked up, I noticed the wild plums blooming along the driveway. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. A much-needed gentle rain fell last Saturday morning as I walked down the hill to get the mail. The day before, there was still much burning of rangeland. Those who finished burning were lucky. Now, with some warm weather, the blackened hills will turn green. In the rural mailbox, my mail was bundled with a rubber band. It was the usual, advertising the water bill and an overseas letter. I held it all under my coat as I walked back up the hill. Sniffing the good scent of rain. Good rain. Maybe some farmers want a gully washer to fill up the ponds. I don't need a gully washer. The reason being what the name says. Gully washer. I don't want erosion. I want to keep my soil. As I walked up, I noticed the wild plums blooming along the driveway. I planted them years ago against the slope. And I remember the gully washer which laid them all bare. And my daughter and I replanted them in the wet gumbo mud. That is a long time ago. Back in the house, I tossed the mail on the table, took off my coat and wide-brimmed hat. 
It's like an Aussie hat. It keeps the rain off my nose. I quickly sorted the letters. The overseas letter was thicker and held something like a pebble. It came from a friend. I admired the clear, strong handwriting. I carefully opened the letter with my pocket knife, then held my breath. Inside the card, which showed a grazing draft horse with sturdy foal, was a small wadded object wrapped in cotton and plastic. Attached to it a note saying, Kogel van het Achterhuis, Jan Goting. That is the brother of my friend. The Kogel van het Achterhuis translate into a bullet recovered from the back part of the house. Jan was born after the war, now retired, had been working on the wall with a pointing trowel, and as he worked, loosened several old bullets embedded in the brick. His daughter-in-law reminded him that I once had said that I would like to have a bullet. So he wrapped one up in soft cotton and gave it to his sister, and she then sent it to me. As she writes in a letter, here it is, at one time a dangerous object, a bullet. The bullet was fired with many more on the night of April 4, 1945. It was not aimed at me, nor any of us who were hiding in the half cellar, as the fighting around us got more intense. Only one bullet was shot into the cellar, but luckily no one was hurt. A Canadian soldier came down during the night and placed a light on the floor and warned us to keep it lit. Later, I've often looked at the wall with all the bullet pockets. The bullets are smashed into the wall and are flattened or crumbled. Still, they can be recognized as bullets. The farm buildings were used as defense positions by the Germans. Sometimes there were three parties in the same building the Dutch family sheltering, the Germans fighting, and the Canadians chasing the Germans, going from room to room, all with a great amount of noise. I'll be honest. When I opened the letter and had read it, I did not immediately open the cotton red bullet. I laid it aside. I just could not. It all happened 73 years ago, April 3, 4, and 5. So much has happened as time moved on that I'm the only one still alive of my immediate family has something to do with it. Suddenly you're back when it all happened. Over the years I've read the battle reports and looked at maps and aerial photographs from just before and immediately after the fierce battle. By studying them again and again, I have become very familiar with the situation. Also how it ended by using the so-called crocodiles, the large flamethrowers mounted on Churchill tanks. By looking at the aerial photographs and seeing the heavy tank tracks made across the farmland, crops and pasture, you can follow what happened. I know where the Canadians parked, their trucks sorted, got ready, and advanced. The battle report with location code gives the progress, and then they reach Betty, code name for where we were. Then they slowly advanced beyond. Several Canadians died, as did civilians and livestock. Holding the small crumpled bullet, I see, hear, and smell it all again. I see myself and my brother Tom later, after the battle, carefully stepping between the burnt timbers of the next farm where my dad had his study. There among the rubble we found an unburnt photograph which had stood on my father's desk in his study. Amazing! Jan was born after the war, painting away, smoothing out the cement or other concrete, 
I wonder what his thoughts were as he filled in old bullet marks. I'm thankful he pulled one out for me to have. Maybe I, on the other side of the ocean, should let it skip a generation and pass it on to my grandson, Matthew. He served in Afghanistan as a Marine. He knows. The land is thirsty. And it is raining here in Manhattan now. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University. Our time's away for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.